basically, if you start node locking some solve, you can justify anything. <laughs> You mentioned, and everyone knows, right? Yeah, you should study to get better. And you've mentioned study so many times. When you say study, what what do you do? How how can people study in order to, to go into the future, right? What should people study? How should people study? And how has your study process evolved, right? Over, over the 15 years you've been playing poker. Yeah, so I, I listened to the couple podcasts and... I either saw people saying that you cannot mimic solvers if you study solvers is bullshit. And yeah, it's definitely some truth about that. And there are other players like, uh, you have to be like super exploitive, nothing else. Uh, I'm mean, basically the same, but others like GTO wizarding on four tables, four hours a day or something like that. And I think it's it's not that simple either way. The like, uh, I definitely had my fair share of staring ten hours by a solver and felt like didn't learn anything, like not even a single thing. Like I tried to, you know, I created super start super complicated strategies. Like I even wrote down, okay, this combo you bet sixty percent or seventy percent. Why would I ever do that? But I think um, you definitely can study stuff which is not useful, but usually it's much more complicated. And even if you want to exploit the shit out of people, you, you have to be watched and look and study a bunch of solves and just realize how people uh, think and how people play. And I think I was really good at modeling these situations. So I would definitely use solvers a lot, but I will use uh, pop tendencies as well and try to like, you know, create some nice node locks. Uh, I, I also have a very good uh, comparison between tennis and poker that I have learned when I go for coaching, we always do like different drills and different stuff. And I feel like it's a, it's not a one game. Then it's not like a one game. It's a multiple different games. Like if you are at the net and doing a volley, it's so much different than doing a big shots from, from the baseline. And I think it's the same in poker. You have so many little different games, like, a a uh, button cut of three bet pot is so much different than a small blind, big blind, open race pot. So basically you just have to learn all these different games. And basically it's a collection of games and you, you want to be good at the most common little games you're going to play. And always it's going to be different. A four bet spot, it's so much different. You have to, you have to practice all of them and learn the basics. And even if you, even if you just look bio sims and you think you don't learn anything, I mean, you have to have to see how it works and how it has the mechanics, mechanics of poker. Shout out to the mechanics. Yes. <laughs> no, but, then, so, but yeah. that's it, right? You have to go in with that mentality of, and that curiosity of how does this work instead of tell me what to do. That's kind of the, the it's like, really much the mentality with which you open the solver. I think you also mentioned, right, that uh, you also misused it when you were trying to implement, okay, I should bet this 60, 70% of the time. And probably you kind of very quickly realized, okay, this is probably not the best way that I should use the solver. <laughs> you mentioned the more effective way of using the solver is to compare like, okay, this is the equilibrium strategy. We understand why that's its way. We look at population tendencies, put in the numbers, run a node lock. I usually recommend also to maybe node lock slowly because in, mer in many spots indeed, because the equilibrium is so fragile, right? If we give it a couple percent more, it just says, well, yeah. just do this 100% of the time. <laughs> so I usually like to yeah, not yeah. exaggerate, but like node lock slowly so we can see, okay, what kind of other first hand that's, that strategies start switching with. Also at later street play, we have to kind of reevaluate. When it comes down to using data to get a better idea of what the pool is doing, right? And what the ranges are. What are like effective ways to use data in your opinion to build strategies? And what are like some 
traps that people should look out for. For example, we talked earlier in this conversation you had with Adam also about biases. And I feel especially in data, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Can you maybe share your, your experience? Yeah, so just one more thing about the, the studying and the not looking. Uh, it's funny, I just came across uh, not so long ago that basically if you start node looking some salt you can justify anything <laughs> yes know, i i saw a video from a guy uh doing some i, th I don't know like middle position calling the three bet with eight six suited and he's saying okay this is a pure fold but if you put that and that into the yeah you can see now it's a pure call and yeah so basically he, they're they're justifying their decision right yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he ended up like, I think, stabbing the flop, stabbing the turn, and step calling the river. And basically, he just said, okay, I don't think they protect their range, so they're going to just be uh, annoyed with ace king and like ace highs and start putting, like turning into bluffs. And basically, he just set everything into the node lock the way he wanted. And obviously it turned out like the super plus CV line. And I was definitely doing this as well. I just realized with an extreme example that yeah, you can you can justify. And also in GTO Wizard, if you if you do drills, like it's really hard to make a big mistake. Like you're gonna usually have these uh, uh, frequency plays and and it seems like you didn't do big mistakes, but maybe you, you did tremendous big mistakes, uh, but you just can't see it. So about the data, uh, it's definitely uh, true that you can, I, I mean, there are some uh, spots where you just have to know, have to learn what is a trustable data. And I don't even, know how to so sometimes i just see it in a video and i realize it's true so let's give you an example i was looking at a pop tendency calling in the big line and if you if you see if you check a, a huge database you see like everything people call is super plus cv and i'm saying yeah the conclusion is just you call everything because people are not that aggressive probably in position and you just get away with it. But then you realize that if people call six, four offsuit, you're gonna see a showdown usually when they win. Like you're not gonna see the six, four suit, six, four offsuit when they fold it on the turn. So it's gonna be like the showdown bias, which I wasn't aware of for a couple of years. And then I realized, yeah, basically the, there are showdowns which can be trusted. Some showdowns cannot be trusted because of the nature of the way how it goes to showdown. And also the uncertainty, like if you have 10 examples, maybe as, as Adam said, maybe it's not, uh, not good enough or not precise enough, but also you can, you can, I, I can't remember this uh, mathematical expression, but you can check the certainty of the number, like a binomial um, mm -hmm. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and basically you can, you can have like a nice uh, educated guess on is this, is this just a, a noise in the data or is this trustful? And yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, I just try to focus on the on the useful data. I remember I remember like before solvers when basically all we had was data or at least the game was way more exploitable right because we were mainly playing on data of other players and you were kind of making strategies on the fly I remember it like sample size issues it was like this guy had a leak and then a month later he didn't have the leak anymore but now i realized <laughs> that probably it was it, it probably it was just statistical uncertainty that made the leak go away it's like oh i thought he had that leak oh he doesn't have the leak anymore so yeah there's definitely some truth in that i do feel like there is a lot of because poker we already have little information and i do feel like if we get some data that's pointing something in wrong direction 
I think if we have to wait until a confidence interval of like 95% certainty, we missed up on a lot of good plus V opportunities. If we wouldn't have been that much of a nit in wanting to have 100% certainty of a stat. And obviously also there's ways you can use multiple stats at all point in the same direction. Um, but yeah, definitely true. Uh, like I said, I've definitely fallen victim of this uh, myself of ignoring kind of uh, sample sizes. I do also feel like in data, for example, if people only, let's say, for example, you see a folded spot, but it's a spot where population itself under bluffs. That means that the majority of the times that they face that bet, it was value heavy, which blocks calling ranges. Therefore, full percentages will go up or people only follow through in like, equity improving scenarios. So there's, there's a lot of, like, it doesn't tell the same story. Like I experimented in my career as well. And friends of mine as well, where you just saw one data point. And you're like, Hey, data point says, so let's go. But you forget that when people arrive in that note, they're telling a story that makes sense. And I'm just now arriving at this note with a story that makes no sense at all. And people are like, what the fuck is this? And they call you down. It's like, well, well, but the data showed that they're overfolding here with 8%. What the fuck is going on? Well, that's because I'm telling a bullshit story with a bullshit hand. So it, it is going to, it is going to screw the data a little bit. Ever experienced anything like this? Oh yeah, man. All the time. I remember one of the podcasts, I just saw you talking about when people say I'm exploiting the flop over C betting because they overfold and then they turn they gonna or or river they think about like what gonna bluff and what I'm gonna bluff and why I'm gonna over C bet the turn as well. And uh, yeah, if, if you did exploitive stuff on the on the flop, like how do you think? Uh, and even in my earlier poker careers, poker career, I loved when I had the reasoning that I discounted some hands from his range on the turn and then add back on the river, like I'm going to get called by that because I get better hand or something. And it's just completely ridiculous. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, had problems with that. And, and I'm, I think I, you just have to learn with the data that some some things are not, not gonna be that useful and you not you cannot be that sure. And I also saw like very weird examples when people overfall turn and you do the node lock and then you realize they still gonna be overfolding even even by the river. And it's just so insane that you 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 would think if you did your exploitive stuff on the flop, then it's over because it's just so much stronger range. But then you realize, oh my God, they still should have called like this weak hands on a certain runout. So it could be really, um, it could be really in, unexpected when when you work with data and. Uh, you just you just have to be really careful and mindful uh, what you you're going to try. Like I remember, I started playing heads up again um, one or yeah one year ago, and I just I just met a guy who was like so freaking aggressive. I just decided that you you can call down this guy with anything and it would be okay. And then I just call down second pair worst kicker, like even blocking his bluffs, like 250 big blind deep. And of course he was just value betting super thin <laughs> and I got destroyed. And you, you have to be really careful about even how, how sick you're gonna exploit because if somebody sees you doing that big of an edge adjustment, they they're gonna just stop do it and and you they're gonna crush you so it's many many times it's not just simple that you just change in one or zero or a or b i remember uh, the stefan challenge against tutti 88 and i think tutti had this same attitude that i had many times that okay stefan equals bluffing all the time what should i do call call all the but time 
it's 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 way more difficult than that and you just you just cannot call down second pairs on a on a flash present stuff like that so you have to be really really careful and uh, i i was watching the your podcast with matt marinelli and he, if you check his graph and and stuff like that he, he looks like the most exploited people person you can imagine and it was interesting from him hearing that he tries to exploit like very slowly like bit by bit and uh, yeah i think it it makes sense it there are some rare rare occasions when you can go full exploit but usually you have to be careful because you you never know uh and and uh, yeah the, the data is the same i think you have to be really careful especially when it's something on the river on a single race spot like three three after three barrel your showdown gonna be i mean much uh, less um compliable. Yeah. Right. 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 Right